So there is one of perhaps 30, 40 things that are called Euler's theorems. Uh, one such Euler's theorem for a body or a um, reference frame. So let's say we have some body with some reference frame attached to it. Let's say EX naught, EY naught, EZ naught. And then the same body with, um, and let's say this is um, a new reference frame, but it's the same body fixed frame. But uh, after you've transformed it, let's say, uh, the reference frame becomes uh, EX1, EY1, EZ1. And let's say to go from this orientation to this orientation, you went through some complicated rotation, translation, whatever, right? Euler's theorem essentially says that um, if you have, let's say two frames, uh, related by a um, related by a rigid by rigid motion of the axes of the rigid body or the uh, reference frame. Um, you can go from the first orientation in other words these directions uh, to the second orientation via a single rotation about some axis given by unit vector n and uh, rotation angle theta. Okay, so this would be the axis of rotation, rotation axis n. Let me write it separately perhaps. So this would be the axis of rotation Okay, so let me just recap. We have some rigid body, perhaps with some axis uh, frame associated with it, some other rigid body or some other frame. Um, and uh, of course, you can go from this frame to this frame. Um, if you ignore the translational part, um, if all you care about is the orientation of these axes, uh, Euler's theorem says that you can, even if you got from this orientation to this orientation by a sequence of rotations, let's say first about x, then about y, then about z, then about x again, then about y again. So if you went through a complicated set of rotations to get from here to here, Euler's theorem basically says that you can get from any orientation to any other orientation in a single rotation. Uh, you just have to pick the axis, an appropriate axis and an appropriate angle. But you can always go from any orientation to any other orientation via a single rotation. That's Euler's theorem. Okay, so that's very important. Um, sort of a sequel to that is uh, called Chasseless or Shawl in French, I think. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this French name, but I think it's pronounced Shawl. Um, but but let's just call it Chasseless for, uh, so that uh, we know exactly what we are talking about for our purposes. Um, this theorem is sort of a sequel to Euler's theorem. It says, um, uh, you have a rigid body, you have the same rigid body somewhere else in some other orientation, we can 
go from um, the position and orientation of from one position and orientation orientation of a rigid body to another by uh, rotating about some axis and translating Uh, along the same axis. So this is interesting and perhaps surprising. Uh, well, perhaps Euler's theorem is also surprising, uh, but maybe we are used to it. Um, so the idea is that you can draw some axis um, in space. Uh, so in this case, all we care about is the um, the direction of the axis. Uh, in this context, uh, we care about the direction, but also the um, position in space of the axis. In any case, uh, once you have an axis like that, you can rotate this object and then translate this object both along the same axis. Uh, rotate about this axis and translate along the axis. In other words, in the direction of the axis. And you can go from anywhere to anywhere is the idea, any orientation as well as any position. That's called this is called the Chasselet's theorem, and this is the Euler's theorem. Um, you won't be using Chasselet's theorem all that much um, uh, in this course, uh, but Euler's theorem, um, at least this version of it, which I'm attributing to Euler, um, immediately suggests a way of representing rotations. We've already seen ways of representing rotations that involve um, rotation matrices, but Euler's theorem uh, immediately allows us to represent rotations by specifying the axis and specifying the angle, okay? So, so representation one is the so-called axis angle representation. which um, is basically you use n and theta. Once you specify n and theta, you've specified the rotation, the axis and axis n. Uh, maybe I write the n better, axis n and angle theta. Okay, so of course, um, n will be some, if you try to represent n in terms of some unit vectors, e x, e y, e z, it'll be n x, e x, plus n y, e y, plus n z, e z, and of course theta. So in once you've, you have some coordinate frame, it's actually four numbers, n x, n y n z comma theta um, so you can represent rotations with four numbers um, now how, how many degrees of freedom is a general three-dimensional rotation we sort of know from well popular culture if you will uh, that 3d rotations are three-dimensional how does that come about well these four numbers are not independent uh, not independent Uh, these four numbers are related by essentially the fact that n is a unit vector. So if n is a unit vector, then you have uh, equals 1. Uh, in, so this is one constraint. So you have 4 minus 1 equals 3 DOF. Okay, so 
um, a 3D rotation is uh, in general three degrees of freedom, okay? Um, so how does the axis angle uh, representation help? So what you would have is a reference configuration of uh, the um, rigid body or the frame. So, so you would have start with a reference configuration of um, the object, some reference orientation, and then, then specifying um, n and theta specifies what orientation the object is currently in. Okay, so that's how you can use n and theta. You specify some reference configuration, and then you can say, okay, given n and theta, it's in some new uh, orientation or configuration depending on what n and theta is. Okay, so in any case, um, so this is one representation that involves four numbers, uh, and we've noted that um, um, it's. Uh, uh, redundant, in other words, it's uh, using more numbers than degrees of freedom, which is fine. Um, it's also not unique, not a unique representation. Um, well, because uh, <coughs> um, so if you have n and um, theta um, is basically equivalent to n and uh, theta plus 2k pi uh, because a rotation by an angle theta will be the same as a rotation by angle theta plus 2k pi for all practical purposes, uh, at least for representational purposes of that eventual rotation. Uh, so there is this non-uniqueness. Um, so this non-uniqueness of theta is one source of non-uniqueness of this axis angle representation. In other words, given a, a rotation, uh, n and theta are not uniquely specified. Another source of non-uniqueness, uh, sort of um, a different source, is that um, if you have one n and theta, uh, that rotation is equivalent to sort of switching the axis direction uh, and switching the angle direction as well, right? So if you had n like so and some theta like so, um, switching the direction basically to minus n and switching the theta to negative theta, uh, you will, uh, can think about it. Essentially, doing an uh, anti-clockwise rotation about this n is the same as doing a clockwise rotation of the same ang uh, magnitude about uh, the opposite. Uh, that's what this is. So there's two sources of non-uniqueness um, in the axis angle rotation uh, representation. Okay. So, uh, so that's one representation of rotation. There's a few more, uh, and uh, let's sort of quickly go through a few more. Of course, you've already seen rotation matrices, and that those are certainly um, a representation of uh, rotations. Uh, rotation matrices are, of course, nine numbers. Uh, they are usually three by three matrices. 
Uh, but of course, as we know, um, uh, rotations are three-dimensional objects. Um, uh, so what is the constraint between uh, these nine numbers that makes it three-dimensional? It turns out it's the condition of orthogonality that R R transpose equals identity. And it turns out this is actually six constraints. You can think about it. Think about why there are six constraints. Um, it's not actually nine constraints, it's six constraints. Uh, so you have nine minus six equals three degrees of freedom. Okay, in any case, um, so this is a perfectly good representation involving nine numbers. It's very redundant. Um, so that might be a disadvantage to using um, this uh, rotation matrix here. You, you are uh, representing with nine numbers what could potentially be represented with three numbers, okay? So that's rotation matrices, and we will use them over and over again through the rest of this course. Um, and then three, uh, there's another representation called quaternions, which are closely related to the axis angle representation, which sort of addresses this source of non-uniqueness. Um, so let me write that down, quaternions. Um, the idea is uh, to use maybe this bold face Q, which, which again has four numbers, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, okay, represent uh, a rotation using four numbers, where we define the four numbers using the N and theta of uh, the axis angle rotation, let's say. So Q1 is actually um, cosine theta by two. Q2 is N X sine theta by two. Q3 is N Y sine theta by two. And Q4 is N Z sine theta by two. And these four numbers are redundant again, because of course you only need three, uh, four numbers satisfy. So what is the condition that they satisfy? They actually satisfy the condition that the sum of squares of these four things equals one. So Q1 square plus Q2 square plus Q3 square plus Q4 square equals one because, well, it's equal to cosine square theta by two plus nx square plus ny square plus nz square sine square theta by two. Um, and of course, this is gonna be equal to, this is equal to one because the unit vector and the square plus the square equals one, okay? So that's a proof of the fact that uh, if you define Q1 to Q4 like so, uh, they satisfy um, this relationship. Um, now, uh, given a rotation, is uh, this representation unique? Unfortunately, it's not unique, uh, still not unique. But that's okay, they, ca they can be made unique. Um, so it's not unique. Uh, because um, uh, if you reverse the whole thing, it's still, uh, take the negative, so negative Q and Q represent the same rotation. Um, for the same exact same reasons that uh, um, these and this represent the same overall rotation, uh, negative Q. In other words, if you switch the sign of all the Qs, that's the same. Uh, that's a, that that will eventually that's that will do the exact same operation on the rigid body as um, uh, the original Qs. Okay, still not unique, but it's this this quaternion representation is what's called a non singular representation. 
um, which means um, that it's well behaved um, and, um, under any condition. Um, small changes in the rotation imply small changes in the quaternion representation and vice versa. That's what non-singular means. Um, the rotation matrix representation is also non-singular. In other words, small changes in rotation will imply small changes in the rotation matrix and vice versa. Uh, and um, the axis angle representation is also not unique, uh, are also um, reasonably well-behaved, although not as well-behaved as the quaternions. Um, um, okay. So that's quaternions. Now, there's a fourth uh, representation of rotations that's very commonly used, Euler angles, which uh, are a singular representation, singularity in the representation. So it's not as good as quaternions. So as good as quaternions, but we will use them a lot. Um, it's actually used as three parameters or three angles to represent rotations. Um, so uh, we will consider Euler angles in a separate uh, video uh, and explain what they are in a moment. But uh, to summarize, uh, we have uh, these four uh, representations of um, uh, rotations. There are lots more representations of rotations that uh, have been proposed, e each of which have uh, different uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, uh, perhaps be beyond the scope of uh, this course. So we shall stop uh, uh, this lecture for now, but in the next uh, video, we will um, uh, expand on Euler angles.